So this chart shows common metamorphic index minerals. Specifically, you have these aluminosilicate polymorphs. And there are three of them. So there's kyanite, selimonite, and andalusite. So these are polymorphs of each other with a composition of aluminum, silicon, and oxygen, Al2SiO5. So depending on the temperature and pressure conditions that a metamorphic rock was exposed to, you're going to find different forms of this composition. So that would either be the kyanite, selimonite, or andalusite. So let's go over how to read this chart. Under which temperature and pressure conditions will andalusite form? So we have 306,000, so 300 degrees Celsius is over here, and then 6,000 atmospheres is over here. So that is kyanite. That's not andalusite. Then we have 700 degrees Celsius and 8,000 atmospheres pressure. So that's also that's also kyanite. Then we have 600 degrees Celsius and 4,000 atmospheres. That is selimonite. Then we have 500 degrees Celsius and 2,000 atmospheres. And that forms andalusite. Okay, so that is the answer, 500 degrees and 2,000 atmospheres. So that is how you read this. And then these are some photos of what these minerals look like. So kyanite is a really pretty blue color mineral. And the lucite is like a, a reddish, almost kind of brownish red color. And then selimonite is this whitish gray color mineral in here. So that's selimonite. Okay, and again, these are all polymorphs, meaning they have the exact same chemical composition but their atoms are arranged in a different fashion in each of these minerals. But they're all made of exactly the same thing. The atoms will arrange differently depending on the temperature and pressure conditions of the metamorphism. This is a photo of Manhattan schist that is exposed at the Earth's surface in Central Park in New York City. Schist is an intermediate grade metamorphic rock that forms deep within a mountain range. This schist indicates that mountains had to have existed in New York City at some point in the past. And we know that because when we look at the chart of the mountain here, we see schist forms deep in a mountain, okay? That's how schist forms. That's the only way schist will form is deep within a mountain. So the fact that we have schist in New York City, we also have gneiss in New York City as well. The fact that we have these highly intense metamorphic rocks or highly metamorphosed rocks, tells us that there had to have been a mountain range in New York City. 
So what happened to these ancient mountains? How did that schist that definitely formed deep in a mountain, how did it become exposed at the Earth's surface in places like Central Park? How are people able to walk on it? And what happened to those mountains? They eroded. Yeah. So the word exhumation explains how metamorphic rocks come to the surface after forming deep in a mountain. Now this process can take millions of years, many millions of years. But it's interesting because it shows us that mountains don't last forever. You have a mountain range and after many millions of years, it could erode down and you are left with what used to be deep inside that mountain, which is now exposed at the Earth's surface. So mountains can erode and pretty much disappear. Kind of an interesting concept. So this exhumation is related to uplift, collapse, and then erosion. So the red dot in this picture represents where the schist is at a particular time. So this is the mountain range and that's the schist deep in the mountain. And then these arrows on either side represent the continents squeezing together during a plate collision. And the rocks in between are pushed upward. And the model here is showing a vise pushing dough and then the dough is pushing upward with the pressure of the vise. Okay, so this would be like Asia and India colliding and the Himalayan mountains, for example. So these rocks are pushed upward as the mountains are forming. And then at some point over time, the rocks that are deeper down are going to soften and the mountain belt will collapse and become thinner. And the model here is that it's like a block of cheese sitting in the sun that kind of softens and collapses. Now you could see already the schist is closer to the surface, even just in this picture without erosion happening yet just because of the collapse of the mountain. So the schist is closer to the surface and then erosion is going to grind away and remove rocks. And then the schist, now you see the schist is pretty close to the surface. So uplift, collapse and erosion is the reason why we are able to walk on the schist in New York City, despite the fact that schist forms very deep inside a mountain. And also now we know that mountains used to exist in the New York City region and those mountains are no longer there. So how are metamorphic rocks classified for identification purposes? Metamorphic rocks are classified based on their texture and the composition. So when we talk about texture, we have specific types of metamorphic textures. So you either have evidence of alignment of mineral crystals, for example, the mineral mica or amphibole Mica, as I discussed in the previous part of the lecture, mica is platy shaped. It's like sheets, so it's able to become aligned. Amphibole is a rod-like shape, so it's able to become aligned as well. So foliated texture, also called layered, is when platy minerals, 
which are flat like sheets of paper, are aligned in a parallel fashion, similar to if you were to hold a deck of cards and all the cards are parallel to each other. And then you could see the layers formed by the pile of the cards. When you look at the, ed the, the edge of the pile, you see like the layers of the cards. So I will just add here, such as mica. Now banding is when you have alternating bands of dark and light minerals. And it's gonna look like dark and light colored stripes. If the rock is banded, you can also consider it to be foliated. And then lineated is when a rock contains elongated rod-shaped minerals like a pencil and they become aligned. Similarly to if you were to hold a bunch of pencils in your hand, you see the lines of the pencils along the side of the bunch of pencils. And then if you turn your hand, you only see either the points or the erasers at the end of the pencils. So the same thing can happen to rod-shaped minerals. Such as amphibole. The same thing would happen with the minerals. They'll become aligned, similar to if you were holding a bunch of pencils in your hand. Then the other type of metamorphic texture is when you have no evidence of any alignment of mineral crystals. So that we call non-foliated. There's no mineral alignment, no evidence of any layers, no parallel minerals. Okay, so classifying metamorphic rock textures is referring to alignment of crystals versus no alignment. Okay, so we have alignment versus no alignment. And this is an example of a mica schist, and it shows you in the, in the picture here what the foliation looks like. So when you look at the edge of the rock, the side of the rock, you have layers. It's a layered appearance. And then here's a sketch that shows you the layers are shown on the side. And that's because the mica, the muscovite mica in this photo has become aligned. And again, that's the mineral that peels into sheets. So it's able to become aligned parallel in flat layers because of the shape of the mica crystals. I have a question in regard to layers, not only on metamorphic rocks, but I guess also in sedimentary rocks. Yes. Um, so I guess I haven't looked deep into it, but I'm aware that I guess geoscientists can determine how long of a time period, a layer of sediment or a metamorphic rock is. Does this relate to, like, let's say, um, is it always consistent? Like, does each layer have a distinguished time period? No. No, okay. With regard to sedimentary. Now, when you're referring to metamorphic, the layers form during the metamorphic event because the crystals, like this used to be shale, which is clay. The clay altered to mica. So as you get mica crystals forming, those are larger than clay particles. So you're able to see the mica and they become aligned because, um, and they, they form these layers because mica is larger than clay crystals. Okay. So the layering, 
in the metamorphism is more like just during the metamorphic event, the layers are forming. So when you see the layers, it's not really the same as like marking a particular amount of time the way that sedimentary layers marks a particular period of time of deposition. But to answer the question again about the sedimentary layers, you can have sedimentary layers that are like a foot thick that may be deposited over a hundred years, or you can have two inches thick layers that took like, you know, five million years to deposit. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. So when you just look at layers, you don't really know how long it took necessarily for that sediment to become deposited. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was just curious. Thank you. That's a good question though. So here are examples of foliated textures related to the parent rock shale. So slaty texture would be related to the rock called slate. That's a low grade regional metamorphic rock. The rock will have a flat surface. The edges of the rock will have a layered appearance and the rock will have a dull luster. This slide, by the way, will help when we do the metamorphic rocks lab because I have descriptions of each of the rock types. So phyllite texture related to a rock called phyllite, which is a low grade regional metamorphic rock. It's higher grade than slate though. It's almost in the, it's sort of in the intermediate range. It's like low grade to intermediate. The rock may have a slightly wavy appearance. It's not as flat as slate. The layers in the rock are more distinct than slate and the rock will have a slightly shiny or satiny luster. And then you have a schistose texture related to a rock called schist, which is a medium grade intermediate regional metamorphic rock. Schist will be very wavy. It may appear flaky or scaly because of the mica present. Schist is also usually sparkly and glittery because of those large mica crystals. The foliated layers are more distinct than phyllite. So again, this was schist. It's sparkly and you could see distinct layering on the side. And then this is slate. So it's a relatively flat rock. It's not sparkly, but you do have distinct layering on the side. And that's your foliation. It's also fine grained because the clay minerals have not grown too large, okay? The phyllite rock starts to become a little shiny because the clay and the mica starts to develop and grow. So that, but that does not happen in slate yet. So slate is not really shiny. Okay, so here's phyllite, which is a little bit more shiny. It's not a flat rock. It's a little bit wavy and bumpy. Okay, and then here is schist again. And it's very sparkly because of the glittery mica, which is coarse grained pieces. This particular rock sample, I believe I found that in Orchard Beach in the Bronx. Now the type of schist depends on the characteristics of the original rock. So there are other types of rock other than, than shale that can become schist. And then it would just change the types of minerals that you have. So you can have a garnet muscovite mica schist. You can have a biotite schist, 
Okay, and that it just depends on what the parent rock was and what type of mineral composition you have present in the rock. And then this is an example of banded metamorphic rocks, your compositional banding, and you have chemical reactions that occur that separate the minerals into light and dark layers. So here you have light and dark stripes. And that's related to felsic and mafic minerals. Felsic being the light colored layers, mafic minerals being concentrated in the dark layers. So we call this compositional banding because it's related to being felsic or mafic in composition. This is a photo of a piece of gneiss in um, the Orchard Beach area in the Bronx. Now, typically the light bands are quartz and feldspar. The dark bands typically are biotite and hornblende. Hornblende is a type of amphibole. Just to add that in. The parent rock of gneiss can be sedimentary, igneous, or metamorphic, actually. So well, there are many different types of rocks that can become gneiss. And in the, in the unmetamorphosed parent rock, the crystals are oriented in all different directions. And then once you have the differential stress applied to the rock, that is related to the metamorphism, the ions move around within the rock and you get those light and dark stripes. So like the heat like sorts them? Yeah, it's the, the ions are able to kind of move around a little bit and they, they kind of just separate into compositional layers. And there's no melting involved though. So the rock remains solid, but like the elements within the rock are able to kind of migrate a little bit. Okay. But it does, it's not that it actually, it, there's no melting involved, which, which is kind of fascinating that this happens. And the end result is that you have these felsic and mafic layers, and that's your banding. Although there's no melting, there's, there's still uh, pressure, right, that's causing this? Yeah, so this is, this is going to be related to high-grade metamorphism. So you have extremely high temperatures and extremely high pressure, but it's not, hot, it's not high enough to cause melting, but it's enough pressure and temperature to cause the ions to move around in such a way where they separate into felsic and mafic bands. Okay, I see. But it's, yeah, it's actually not melting though. It's just the ions within the minerals are able to move around. And then like when I showed you the picture of the migmatite, this is the migmatite, very, very high grade metamorphic rock in the Bronx. So some of the rock actually started to melt because it was so high grade. And then this is a summary of the metamorphic grade with their textures. So shale undergoes low grade metamorphism and turns into slate. And you're gonna have chlorite and mica minerals, but they're still gonna be small. But if you see the clay in the beginning is oriented kind of a little bit more randomly, the slate, they're more parallel. And then here you have the parent rock granodiorite, which is like a granite diorite. That's where the word granodiorite, it's either granite or diorite. It has um, it has randomly oriented mineral crystals, interlocking texture, because this is an igneous rock. 
and then it undergoes high grade metamorphism and the compressional forces and high temperatures will deform the rock and cause layering, mephic and felsic layering. But the deformation from the pressure is also causing them to become like folded looking. So it's kind of like, they go like up and down, kind of like wavy looking. That's related to the pressure applied to the rock. Okay, and then again, we have migmatite that's partially melted. For example, gneiss that has undergone partial melting related to very high grade metamorphism. So migmatites have igneous and metamorphic features. The light colored minerals begin to melt first because of Bowen's reaction series, where felsic minerals melt at lower temperatures than mafic minerals. So as you heat up a rock in high grade metamorphism, the first, thing, the first minerals to melt are gonna be quartz and feldspar. So you're gonna get granite bands of you know, igneous granite. So you'll have pegmatite within, an, within a metamorphic rock, just like that photo I just showed you. Then you have a rock called amphibolite. This is a dark rock. The main minerals include amphibole, or another word for the type of amphibole is hornblende. Also, you have plagioclase feldspar. Amphibolite is a slightly foliated rock. You're gonna see black sparkly crystals that are aligned in a parallel or almost parallel fashion. So amphibolite can be considered foliated or non-foliated, depending on the sample that you are looking at. And amphibolite forms from metamorphosed ocean crust, basalt or gabbro. And this is a photo of amphibolite at Orchard Beach. So it's a black sparkly rock. Amphibolite is also called a hornblende schist. So depending on what textbook or lab book you're using, they may use the term hornblende schist instead of amphibolite. Then we have metaconglomerate, which is a metamorphosed conglomerate. And you can see the pebbles are flattened kind of smush looking. So this is considered to be foliated because you have alignment where the pebbles have like that parallel appearance to them. And what about the non-foliated metamorphic rocks? Again, non-foliated was that there's no preferred orientation of minerals. There's no alignment of mineral grains. Now, due to their crystal shape, minerals such as quartz and calcite do not undergo alignment regardless of the metamorphic conditions. So even if there is dif differential pressure, you're not going to form alignment in a quartzite or a marble, for example. And it's related to the shape of quartz and calcite being pretty equidimensional, meaning like every part of the quartz or calcite crystal is the same size and shape. So if you think of a circle or um, like a hexagon, those are shapes that are the same around the whole shape. And then if you have a lot of circles all next to each other, you're not really aligning those circles. So non-foliated textures can be related to contact metamorphism where there's no differential pressure at all, or regional metamorphism of rocks that do not have elongated or platy minerals. So even if there is differential pressure, 
the elong there are no minerals that have a shape that could show alignment. Okay, so mainly quartz and calcite. So the rocks quartzite and marble are not going to show alignment. Okay, so marble is related to either contact metamorphism or regional metamorphism of limestone. Limestone is mainly made of calcite. Marble can be coarse grained or fine grained. And any colors in marble are from impurities that were in the parent rock. Now marble can also have banding in it, but that's usually a remnant of the original sedimentary bedding in the original limestone. But that's not the same as nice being banded with alternating dark and light minerals. So even if marble is banded, we still consider it to be a non-foliated rock. So this is marble that's banded, okay? That's only related to the original sedimentary bedding when it was limestone. Again, the different colors of marble are related to impurities in the original limestone. So here's, here's a marble quarry in Italy. And then quartzite forms from quartz sandstone. It's related to moderate to high grade metamorphism and you may have impurities that add color. So quartzite sometimes could be red or like a purple color. I've even seen green quartzite or quartzite could be white or gray, tan color. So your small quartz greens in the sandstone fuse together and recrystallize into larger interlocking crystals. So you end up with a very hard rock called quartzite. So here are sand grains in a quartz sandstone. And then you have the metamorphism and this is quartzite. So you no longer really see the individual quartz grains, the sand grains. It's more like they, they look like they're more fused together. Other non-foliated rocks include hornfells. There are many varieties of hornfells, but mostly they're from sedimentary protoliths, such as shale. Hornfells specifically is related to contact metamorphism. And it's going to be a fine-grained rock with a dull luster and no foliation at all. Other non-foliated rocks include anthracite coal. This is a hard coal with about 90% carbon, and it forms due to the metamorphism of sedimentary bituminous coal. It's related to very low grade metamorphism related to burial, about eight to 10 kilometers deep with heating up to 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. Generally, this type of Rock forms along mountain belts, but not deep within the mountain belt, just along the mountain belt. Then you have serpentinite, which is a dark green rock from the metamorphism of mafic igneous rocks, such as ocean crust. And this is related to low or high grade metamorphism. Then you have an additional texture term. The word is porphyroblast. That is when a metamorphic mineral is a larger crystal among a finer grained ground mass. Porphyroblasts form as a result of rapid growth rates of certain minerals during metamorphism. Common minerals that form porphyroblasts include garnet, andalusite, kyanite, and albite. Albite is a feldspar mineral. 
So here you have a mica schist with larger chunks of garnet. And then here's a close up of that garnet. And this is how we form quite a bit of our gemstones. So someone may mine for garnet and then like extract these chunks of garnet and use those for jewelry if they're in good enough quality condition they would could be used as jewelry and then again it's because the garnet grows faster than the rest of the crystals in the rock so that's why the rest of the crystals are smaller and the garnet is larger And here are some porphyroblasts of selimonite. Now I just want to remind you that sometimes in photos you'll see a picture of a, a coin and that's just to show you the scale of the photo. So now we know like these minerals are approximately the size of a penny or like half of a penny. Yes, was there a question about this slide? or you just wanted to look at it again. Oh, the PowerPoint presentations are on Blackboard. You can download the whole PowerPoint presentation. Okay. And then I did mention earlier that when you identify metamorphic rocks, it's based on texture and composition. So now we could talk about the composition. So you have a whole list of different metamorphic rock compositions. You have calcareous, which is related to carbonate rocks. Calcareous rocks contain calcite or dolomite. The parent rock was either limestone or dolostone. Or you may have impure carbonates, which are called marl, which may contain mud or sand along with the calcite or dolomite crystals. Now, as you re may remember from the mineral lecture, and the sedimentary lecture is that minerals like calcite and rocks like limestone react with acid. So that also means that if your rock is calcareous, it most likely will react with acid by bubbling. So if you're out somewhere on a field trip identifying rocks, Sometimes geologists will carry a little bottle of hydrochloric acid, diluted, but they'll carry a little bottle. And if you put a little drop of acid on a calcareous rock like marble, it will most likely react with the acid and form little bubbles. Then we have a luminous or pellitic composition and those metamorphic rocks are from the parent rock that was shale or mudstone. So they're aluminum rich clay minerals. That's the main component of an aluminous metamorphic rock. It used to be an aluminum rich clay mineral rock like shale or mudstone. And then that becomes metamorphic. Mafic means the parent rock was a mafic igneous rock like basalt or gabbro. A quartz composition is going to be from a parent rock that was almost pure quartz like chert, which we did in the sedimentary lecture and lab. Chert was like jasper, flint, or agate. Those are all types of chert. Or a quartz sandstone, parent rock. 
Quartzofelspathic means the parent rock was rich in quartz and feldspar. So that would be like Arcos sandstone or granite. And then lastly, we have carbohydrate composition. And that's related to the parent rock being bituminous coal. And then the metamorphic rock would be anthracite coal.